Well, hello everyone and welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And Kevin, we're are we're kind of going through a lot right now, aren't we? There's a lot going on. Yeah, we're we're still stuck at home. Or <laughs> Enjoying being at home, in my yes. case. <laughs> yes. And uh, uh, enjoying being stuck at home. Um, but now there's some other really not bad things going on. Our, our society is uh, really struggling here in the United States right now with um, riots and looting, um, lots of other stuff. And there's a lot of pressure to talk about it, isn't there? Yeah. Um, people I don't, even, I don't know if, people yeah, even ahead. saying online that if, if your church didn't address it on Sunday, you should leave and find a different church. Yeah. I mean, that, that does seem to happen a lot when, whenever something like this comes up. Uh, I mean, the same thing happened with COVID when we were mm -hmm. stuck at home. It's you got to immediately respond to this. So we're not going to talk about the issues necessarily because we don't want to dive into them I mean, frankly they're straightforward and complicated at the same time um, mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll say that much but like we do on this podcast we do want to spend some time digging into scripture on okay how do we think about this stuff particularly when the culture is looking at the church or I'll, I'll say the world. Um, in our catechism, we talk about the world, our flesh, and the devil being the three things that are against us and fighting against us, the three things to resist. Those are bad things. So in this case, I'm going to use world in, in that sense. When the world looks at the church and says, you need to respond to this, you need to speak to whatever the issue is, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, how do we handle that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, um, I think anybody who's who's tried to be a public Christian, and that might seem like a strange phrase for some people listening, but meaning anybody who's tried to stand up for their faith in public, and so be known as a Christian by their friends or mm -hmm. loved ones or coworkers or whatever and whether Facebook newsfeed, Facebook newsfeed, whatever. <laughs> and you know, you don't have to be a pastor to do this, but anybody who's kind of known as being the church going guy or girl or whatever. Right. Yeah. And then something like this happens and people kind of look at you and say, well, what does Jesus think about this? Where's your God now? Right. Where, how does your God deal with it? Or how does your religion or how does your church or, or how do you as a Christian? And all of a sudden you find yourself representing all of Christianity. Yeah. And the problem is a lot of times we don't know what to say. We don't know what the church is supposed to say or do or, or I mean, if we even would hesitate to, to think such a thing, what God would, would speak if he was present. And now, now I'm supposed to speak for him. That's and now, and you're put on the spot too. And yeah. there, there's and an then, expectation. There, well, so there, there's this phrase that gets tossed out: "Silence is consent." Yeah. Um, or if you don't speak out against it, you therefore support it, or things like that. And so there's additional pressure that is really strongly applied to anybody, but especially Christians, that you have to speak. If you don't, we, the world out here, are watching and will judge you. Yeah, and and it's really hard. Um, it really is, and we're not we're not being facetious about that. It's it's yeah. difficult. It's yeah. it really is something that we struggle with, and and you know, as Lutherans, we we talk about the theology of the cross that, and it's not just saying that that um, the cross is the center of our theology because it is, but it's also saying that as we live in this world in which there aren't always clear answers to every situation, we bear the cross of of the of bearing Jesus being Christ followers being Christians little Christ even mm -hmm. and yet not always knowing exactly how to live that out in this world and it becomes a cross because it's a, it's a struggle it's a it's something that we struggle with and and you talk about as you try to live out your faith in the midst of the world the devil and your sinful flesh it's a war and and what's frustrating to a lot of us is that I don't mind fighting a war when I'm totally sure who the enemy is and who the right yeah. side is. I don't mind that fight, even if I get as long as I know bit. which way I'm right. supposed to shoot. But we're I good. Think what's, what yeah. gets difficult is that I'm not even totally sure 
what war I'm fighting, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> and it's also like, well, you handed me a Nerf gun. How yeah, is this going to help? <laughs> and and so I think this is one of the situations where the, where the church is looked at by the world. And I think even sometimes, honestly, people are saying, well, what does the church have to say? What does God think about all this? And, and there is a right sense that the world does that because they know that God has something to say to evil. Mm-hmm. And so there's a sense in which the world, um, even the, by the, in spite of the fact that it's the world, <laughs> right. in, in, the, in the sinful sense that I started off introducing it, still has the law written on their hearts, as, as Scripture says. They still know that, eh, to a certain degree, evil is bad. We, we may differ on what evil actually is in terms of the world, but they know evil is bad, and they know the church is against evil, and they know God is against evil, or they've heard these things from us. And so there's a sense in which they're right to look at us and say, okay, we see this thing that's evil, we know you're supposed to be against evil. We know that you tell us that God is against evil. What do you have to say? Um, so, Kevin, let's start there. We're, we're, without falling into the trap of being forced to speak the way they want us to speak, because I think that's the difficulty with a lot of this is our, our inclination is, well, they're asking a specific question. I need to answer that specific question. Um Anybody who's listens to our podcast, uh, who has listened to it for any length of time, knows that we usually will be like, well, we're going to change the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're going to redirect this a bit and then come back. Well, I, I think we need, I think that's what we got to do, right? Well, I think, yeah. It, not always redirect the question, but but kind of help. I think I think what we want to do is is help each other in the church understand how God is part of our current reality and yet is not subject to our current reality. Okay. And I think a lot of times we're tempted to read the scriptures based on our desire to understand a current reality. So what that means is we open the Bible to find explanations of what's going on today and in that what that tends to do is it leads us to read scripture in a lens that moves the focus from what God has done in Christ to how do I find the words or parallel ideas or um, parallel thoughts to what I'm seeing in my world today. So we, we might go through the Bible and look at um, boy, there seems to be a lot of talk of injustice. So does the Bible say anything about justice? And then we say, well, that makes sense because there seems to be a lot of injustice and justice talk today. So we're going to quote Bible verses that have to do with justice. And you'll find a lot in the Bible about justice. Um, Mishpat, which is kind of the Hebrew word for justice. Is, I, I is thought a, you sneezed. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it, that's, a, you. that's a big idea in the in the prophets, especially. Um, you think Amos, it, there's a big deal about justice in Amos. Micah, um, Isaiah, certainly. Um, My, that, Micah's the popular one. Right, Do right justice, now everyone's have running mercy to, and walk humbly, walk with, humbly with your God. God yeah, right. That's um, the big one. So, and, and we read these verses and we think, well, that's a, that is a good verse. I like that verse. It, sorry, that do says, justice, love mercy. And hunt, walk home right. to your God. Yeah, Micah sorry. 6, 8. So, <laughs> um, I think it's 6, 8, isn't it? I believe so. That's, that's so, the one that comes to mind for me, too. So, th- that sounds good. Well, let me, th- let me throw out another one really quick, too, because it only because it's not in the current news cycle, but I guarantee you it will come back. Immigrant. And, right. And the word immigrant. So, we see in the news immigrants and things happening at borders, things happening in other countries all around. So we open up our Bible and say, okay, where does the Bible have the word immigrant? I'm going to look at those passages or f- and or foreigner. Or, right, or stranger or alien. Yeah. You say, oh, those are, bibli- another- those are Bible-y words about yeah. immigration. You know, so th- that's what the Bible is saying. So I'm going to go to those passages, see what the Bible says, and then immediately apply that straight to this current situation because, well, it's the same word. Therefore, it's got to be that that's that's how this works right and the world does this. Uh, th- this you actually will hear this well i went to the old testament here's what it says about strangers and foreigners and sojourners here's what you're supposed to do 
All right, church, let's see you do that. Or or they'll say, um, you know, I looked it up and it says this and how in the world could God say such things? Yeah, the other side of it, yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, don't look up strangers and aliens and foreigners in the book of Joshua. Or judges. <laughs> that ain't going to work too well. You know, you're told to wipe them all out and kill them. So, and, and everybody say, well, that's not what it means. Obviously, that doesn't apply because that, that can't be right. You know, God's a God of love. He's not going to tell you to do that. So then we start, now what's happening is we're starting to interpret. Now we're starting to say, well, that passage can't apply. And the yeah. question is why? Why are we now picking and choosing passages? And this is this is really, I think, in this podcast, one thing we've been trying to do, successfully or unsuccessfully, I don't know. <laughs> you guys will have to tell us. Questions to, at crucialproductions.org. Yes. Send us an email. Let tell us, us if we're successful. <laughs> right. Or, or that we're utter failures. That's fine, too. Yes. And how um, we can do better. Yes. Well, or try to do better. Or Yeah, that, too. The, All right. Sorry, Kevin. But continue. what we've been trying to present, and, and we, we believe this because this is the way we believe, is that scripture is about Christ, about what God has done in Christ to save his people. And it's not about America in the 21st century. It's not about Peter. It's not about Kevin. But it's the book a, is named after me, Kevin. Well, there is. Yeah, you, you just have don't a, have a book named I don't after have a book, you. That's so why you're little, upset. I'm a little yeah. sore. I got two. But, yeah. Well, you have a first <laughs> and a second. I don't know if that counts as a two, but. Um, uh, I'm going to take it. Yeah. Anyways. You also were called Satan at one point in the scripture, so. Oh, no, no, that doesn't that. apply. Remember, right. Kevin? See, that doesn't apply. <laughs> I don't like that <laughs> That one. doesn't apply. <laughs> but that's exactly what happens. We start, we start saying, oh, I found it over here, and it says this, and I found it over there, and it says that. And let's just use the strangers and aliens things, because that's that's maybe not as hot as a topic right now, although it probably is in some ways. Um, it, it, and like I said, it will come it's back. It's coming back. So don't it will worry. become a hot just topic wait again. It. Wait for yeah. it. It's, it's like the big ties from the 70s. I'll come back. We will be relevant in about three months with this podcast. No, or Peter, less. we will never be relevant with this podcast. Okay, fine. That's actually one of the stated goals, I think. But <laughs> anyway, dear listener, um, I, when we talk about strangers and aliens and we go look up a verse in the Old Testament, we say, oh, look, it says strangers and aliens and treat them, you know, the, the people that are not from Israel in your midst and say, wow, that looks like somebody that would apply to immigration, right? And it sounds good, but, but let's just pause for a second and ask some questions. When you apply that verse to today's context, who are the strangers and aliens? What defines them as strangers and aliens? They are not part of a certain people group. Well, they're not part of Israel. Right, and in the Old Testament, not part of Israel. So yeah. now we have to find the correct parallel to Israel in today's world in order to figure out what that passage is talking about for people in our world. See, people are not strangers and aliens. They're only strangers and aliens when you're talking about it from a certain point of view. And Ooh, in the old we got a Testament, Star Wars quote in exactly here. from a certain point of view. <laughs> certain point of view. <laughs> so, um, yeah, <laughs> <Isn't that fun>? <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm good at derailing things yeah. today, but I promise but, I'll bring us back. But the important thing is, then we start saying, okay, they're strangers and aliens mean they're not part of Israel, and yet they're living within Israel. And so what's the parallel today? And one thing I'm going to tell you is a bad interpretive move is to say that Israel is America today. Yeah, there's entire theologies built right. around that. And, and that's a move that's no. just right out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if, it's not that five hard to, is right out. It's right out. You don't have to think about it too hard to understand why this is a grave mistake. Because what happens is, if Israel is fulfilled in America today, then all the promises about Israel have to be fulfilled in America. Yeah, you can't. You can't just take this one little section of scripture, pull it out, and say, "Okay, I'm going to apply this to today," because you've ripped it out of the entire narrative of scripture. You've ripped out of its entire context, and which. Israel is a massive concept within all of scripture. And you can't just like take a verse and say, here you go. And That's, it means this now. And everybody who knows how to read the Bible properly agrees that the New Testament pictures Jesus as a fulfillment of the people of Israel. I mean, this is the point of Matthew's gospel. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is one of his major threads in his gospel is that Jesus is Israel in the flesh. Um, 
Israel reduced to one. Israel as it's reduced often to one is a way to say it. Yeah. Um, even Adam. A lot of people would say that that Adam is a prefiguring of the nation of Israel, and then Jesus is the second Adam. He is Israel in one. I mean, this this thread goes throughout Scripture, and it's a, not another, America. So what's happened is we've actually replaced Jesus as a fulfillment with America as a fulfillment. So I hope right away you guys are seeing the problem here. I mean, a, another way to look at it is Israel. The point of Israel was not so God could have his own country. Right. Exactly. That, wasn't, that wasn't the That's point. That's right. Israel was actually pointing to something much better, which is Jesus. Jesus. And, and Kevin, I, I, I'm going to feel free, feel free to say let's not go there yet after I say this. But this is kind of what makes this difficult in having this conversation. It's, it's easier in person. I, I will say that right off. If you actually can talk to somebody in person and have this conversation, it's much easier because then you can actually have a conversation. But I think most of us are having these conversations on Facebook right. or Twitter, which is even harder. Um, maybe if you're putting out a YouTube video, you might be able to at least give a full thought um, in that. But then the argument happens in the, in the comments section there. But the point being... I, I want to learn how to, when the, wor- when the world asks this question, I mm-hmm. want to learn how to answer back to them, wait, hold on, this, this scripture, this is actually about Jesus, and let me tell you how he's the answer to this, and that's not actually, it's not what the world is asking. Right. And that, that's, why, that's why I said we're going we're gonna to redirect or we're going to change, because the world isn't asking for us to answer in that way. And actually the world is going to hate that answer, but Kevin, right. how do I answer that way? So, so this is, this is the first thing. This is kind of the warning, you know, to, to anybody who's about to engage in this kind of discussion on Facebook or anything else is, and, and I just taught this Sunday in Bible class, the world is going to hate you when you tell them the truth. This is not Dale Carnegie, how to win friends, right? This is, it's I, not, I took that course. It doesn't yeah, work. It doesn't on work, Peter. <laughs> um, it doesn't work with Christianity either because yeah. The, so here, here's one of the things we want to think through is that the world thinks that God being love means that the goal is to get everyone to like you and to be kind. And feel good. And, and that's, the way you do that is to make people feel yeah. good. Right. Yeah. You feel good about yourself. Other people feel good about themselves. We all feel good about each other. So we can't we can't be intolerant. We can't be whatever because that's not loving. Well, the problem is you can't read the Bible very long and come away with that impression at all because God is really not into making everybody happy. Yeah. He's really not trying to, can't we all get along here? That is not what God is up to in the Bible. Especially that whole sin problem. He's got yeah. some pretty strong things to say about that. And I happen to have a sin problem. Right. So it doesn't make me feel good when he says those things to me. <laughs> so so the first the first thing to think through is that the scriptures are not about God trying to include everyone into some kind of happy story that ends well. That's not the goal of the Bible. The goal of the scriptures is to reveal what God has done to save people. That's the goal of scripture. God has done something to save people. He has one definitive act to save humanity. And all have, of scripture have, points to that act. I have John 3.16 running through my head now. Yep. Because that's like Good. the perfect summary, especially for all of that we have going on and the different topics we've brought mm-hmm. up. For God so loved the world. Hey, that's everyone. It's everyone. So, so we can't exclude anyone from the human race because anyone. they're all included. That, um, that he gave his only son, Jesus. Uh-huh. I'm saying it slowly and in pieces. I completely it forgot hard. it. That's right. I know. It's like, wait a minute. What's that the whoever uh, believes? Whoever believes in him should not perish. As long as I go all the way right. through, I'm good. You're good. Uh, but have but have everlasting life. I mean, there there it is in a nutshell. So we've we've handled the love part. So there right. there's God is love. We've got but, the world. That's everybody. Nobody's excluded. Uh uh oh, we're gonna perish. Yeah, see, now here's the problem is, is, and this actually happened to me. I was talking to a friend who, who was offended at the idea that they would need saving. And they yeah. said that that was oppressive, that, that they would need a savior and that they couldn't do it themselves. So they felt that the Bible was oppressing them. 
Well, and this, so this even, is why even the message of salvation yeah. is going to be heard as an unkind message. And th- this is what we have to remember and why you said the world is going to hate this. That's that's why. Because mm-hmm. we're going to tell them you are doomed. Right. If you keep doing things the way you are, believing what you believe, no matter how good it makes you feel, you are doomed. There, there is literally no hope for you at all, right. ever. And <laughs> and what happens is when you understand that the scriptures are written to reveal to us God's definitive action to save mankind, and I say it that way on purpose because that definitive action is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. That is God's definitive action to save mankind. Now, notice he didn't ask for my help. Yeah. <laughs> and the Bible has nothing to do with me. In fact, just, it says, just listen while to that. we were yet sinners, right. Christ but, died for but us. But the we in that passage isn't Peter and I. Yeah. Okay? So let's let's not make the Bible about us. And that's the other problem we have, is that we, we, we run quickly to an interpretation where I am the center of Scripture. So it's either our world and our current events are the center of scripture, or I am the center of scripture, or my situation is the center of scripture. And so we, we read the whole Bible trying to figure out how God is worried about the things I'm worried about and how the things that are freaking me out are freaking God out, or the things that are causing me stress are causing God stress. And we say, well, what has he done about it? And we find these passages that either help us or make it worse or whatever. And, and then we go and we go run down the path with, you know, our, our concordance in hand, which I can do all things school. through Christ right. who gives me strength. And then you Whoa, find little, I'm having a verses. hard time, right? Yeah. I'm having a hard time right now, or I'm not able to bench press this. There's my verse. Right. And so <laughs> we, we make these little Bible verses into to talismans or good luck charms, where we kind of say it when we need a little boost of inspiration or help or confidence or something. And what gets left behind all of this is Christ. Yeah. And here, here's and, here's here's the thing we it's it, it's easy to see it when I we do what I just did I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength therefore I can bench press 500 pounds we we see that and realize that's ridiculous mm-hmm. that's not what that means that's not what that's about it's about something else but when it comes to these other things these current events or the world wanting us to respond why is it so hard for us to see that that's not what this is about. Why, how so, do, why do we forget? <laughs> so we run to Micah 6, and it says, what does the Lord require of you? And we think, ooh, see, there you go. Now we're asking a good question. What does the Lord require of you? Well. To do justice. To do justice. To love mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. And we think, well, those are universal truths. Right? I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, these are universal truths. This seems to, to be a verse that isn't specifically about a particular situation it kind of seems like one of those um we call it nomic but it's generally speaking that, this is that what that god applies. wants of right. you it's generally yeah. but, but then all of a sudden i just encourage you to, to slow down and read the verse what does the lord require of you who's the you see who is the prophet writing to who is the prophet addressing and once again you're going to find out that it's israel israel yeah so it's not what does God require of general humanity and then how do we apply that to every situation? It's actually talking to the church, the people of God. What does God require of his church? What does God require of his people? Well, it's actually quite amazing what he requires. He requires for us to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And you start thinking, well, what is the justice of God? It's actually the forgiveness of sins. God, how, who how, is God, who is faithful and just, will forgive your sins oh. and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Hey, look! It's another thing we do every Sunday. Every Sunday, we that say actually it. helps us understand this, right? <laughs> exactly, and and you find out that forgiveness of sins is God's justice meted out in this world, and and you think, oh well, loving mercy. Wait, that's forgiveness of sins in this world. Walk humbly with your God. Oh, that's you repentance. Think, right. And you think, <laughs> okay, so now we're now we're with repentance. Now we're with with um, you know, 
First Peter. You should know this, Peter. First Peter five. No, I only know First Peter three. All right. Well, we should look it up then. <laughs> you should look up First Peter five. We'll, let's we'll go to First loud. Peter five. Let's go to First Peter five. I want to. I want you to see this. Okay. Let's do that. That's before Second Peter, right? It's it's right before Second Peter. All they, right. they they arranged them easy to find that way. Where am I looking in First Peter? First Peter, Peter 5? five six. Okay. I've got the NASB today. Is that okay, Kevin? We'll see what it says. <laughs> Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. So so just listen to what that says there. Humble yourselves before God or under the mighty hand of God. And then it says, and, and really in the Greek, it, it really reads this way. The way you humble yourself is by casting all your anxieties on him. Hmm. See, the humility that God requires is not humility necessarily like in a worldly way, but it's actually submitting ourselves to God with the understanding and the faith that he is God and I am not. So the proper place to cast my anxieties. Now I have a Stephen place, Curtis Chapman song stuck there in my you head. Go. Very good. <laughs> that, the, the proper place to turn for, with our sins the proper place to turn with our anxieties, the proper place to turn with our racial tension is to turn to God and to listen to his word and believe that his will and his way are better than mine. See, I, I want to back and, up really quick. Sorry, because when you mentioned the Micah verse, I immediately didn't do that. Right. I mean, you said, oh, where? well, what is justice? I even even though we've had this conversation and we've gone through this, the first thing my mind did wasn't, oh, what does God's justice look like? Oh, that's forgiveness of sins. No, it went to, well, obviously it's the justice of the world out there. Right. And the, and the mercy, having mercy on, on immigrants at the border, obviously it's that. Like, the, the, we all, it is so hardwired, and I don't yes. know if this is a human thing, if it's an American thing, or if it's just simply a sin thing, mm -hmm. that I have to work really, really hard to mm -hmm. not think that it's the world's definition of it, to let Scripture actually define it for me. Right, and we've we've talked about this before with yeah. with love. <laughs> when we say that God is love, and then we say, okay, who gets to define love? And if the world defines love and they were saying, well, God is whatever the world decides love looks like, well, that's not, that's not a true statement, right? God is love, how? In this, that he sent his only son into the flesh to be our savior, you know, and this mm. is love. Not that we love God, but God loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins, 1 John 4, 10. So we, we learn what love is by looking at God's action in Christ. Well, here's the thing. We learn what justice is by looking at God's action in Christ. We learn what mercy is by looking at God's action in Christ. And and this is what I would say about the current situation right now. We learn how to see people by God's action in Christ. Yeah. We, we learn to see each and every person as someone for whom the Son of God willingly sacrificed himself to win for them forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And if God so loves them, so we ought to love. It's it's not a, I, I think we, our culture tends to talk about maybe an inherent human value. Right. Uh, but only in certain circumstances, because abortion isn't part of that. But generally, uh, inherent. Neither is evolution or survival, right, yeah. you know, whatever, whatever path you want to <laughs> go down that isn't in the it, news today. It, yeah, by virtue of being human, they have value. We're, we're not saying that. No. What we're saying is that Scripture actually says everyone has value because Christ gave them that value by dying for them. Right. All value. We've, we've talked about this a little bit in terms mm -hmm. of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, and now it comes, it, it applies here as well, that your, your value is never found in anything of yourself or the world, your value is only and always found in Christ. So, so why is that important? See, see, this is what's so important. And, and Peter, you, you grew up in foreign countries. I grew up in a foreign country part of my life. 
um, we've both been to different places where there's different cultures and different languages and different people with different skin color were actually were the minority, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Unlike America, where we're <laughs> not the minority. I, I lived in a place for three weeks where there were people who had never seen a white person. Right. So Ever. So, but see, here's the thing. Listen to what, listen to what we just said and how that applies in that situation. Every person is someone for whom Christ has died. I didn't say every tall person or every short person or every thin person. I didn't say Be- every bearded American, people. bearded people, Beard, Bearded persons have a little bit of an edge, but. Right? <laughs> but. But when I didn't say those things, I also wasn't excluding them because every person is someone for whom Christ has died. And let us learn to see people that way. This this is not us doing a, well, to fit with the current situation, well, it's not Black Lives Matter, it's all lives matter. We're not actually saying that at all. No, uh, I, I, I could see people hearing us saying that, but once again, that's taking the world's labels and definitions and putting them on what we're saying. We're saying, no, 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 don't even start there. Start right. with how Christ sees you. Okay, now that you've got a handle on that, which we've shown is extremely difficult to actually get a handle on that, <laughs> mm-hmm. probably because of my sinful nature. Uh, pretty sure that's a part of this here. Right. N- once you have a handle on that, okay, now... How does that cause you to live with your neighbors, right. with so, those you encounter? So if, if God loves every human enough to send his son to die for that person, then there can be no room in the church for racial problems. There can be no room in the church for even looking at race and defining people that way. We simply see every human, every single person, as someone for whom Christ died. And the only thing that we see that would be different between people is whether or not they are in Christ or out of Christ, right? Mm, If they are in Christ, then they are a brother or sister in Christ and we love them as such. If they are not in Christ, then that's somebody for whom we desire the gospel to be proclaimed, to bring them into the family. See, that's, that's how we see people. That's how we see humanity. And so, Christians can't be racist. It's it's antithetical to our view of humanity. We in just the same way we can't be discriminatory against whatever you want to bring up that would be a quality of a person. Is the only thing we care about is that you are born in sin and that's not good for you. That's going to kill you and everyone around you and it's going to end up in eternal punishment. God has done something to rescue you from that. That's what we want you to know. That's how we want to also love you. And and what we're talking about is these texts in Scripture that people want to grab, it really is talking about Israel and how Israel is supposed to love Israel because of the people of God. And what that means is, is that the church is supposed to love the church as an example to this world of what the love of God looks like hmm. in this world. Yeah. And when they ask us why we love that way, the answer is because we have been loved with an even greater love. And so what that means is, is the church loves with the love of God. And the the messiness of living in this situation right now is it's all tied up with, with politics and view on government and view on the history of these issues and views on what's the right way to get out of them as a society and all those kinds of things. And, and when someone says, what do the Bible has to say about that? That the, the correct answer is it doesn't, it doesn't give us direction forward on how to deal with the political ramifications or that. But what it does teach us is, is how to see humanity, how to see each and every human is that this is a person for whom Christ has died. So if we're going to look to scripture, what we're going to find is that scripture's just depiction of humanity is a whole lot worse than we hoped it would be because it sees every person as a sinner guilty, right? Mm-hmm. No one is good. Not even one. And it's also a whole lot better than we thought it was going to be because all of those sinners are, are people for whom Christ shed his blood, 
died and rose again. And through that, he gives freely the gift of salvation, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. And we are called as his servants to love with that love. Okay, so it's it's much more simple mm-hmm. in, in one way, because that's the actual answer to all of this, and that's that's simple. We all know mm-hmm. that we're Christians uh, because we actually believe that, and we and we know that. But I I can't give that answer. I mean, <laughs> how? How do I approach the world that doesn't want to hear that answer when that is the only answer that's even worth giving? Um, When they want, look, you're ignoring the politics of this, you're ignoring the systemic nature of this, you're ignoring any any number of things, you're not relevant, you're um, tone deaf. I mean, I'm trying to think of so many different ways that the world comes back and says, you don't understand this. And at some point we have to say... (laughs) You know, what I am saying to you is actually eternally true. You're trying to solve a problem that's existing in, you know, this cropped up in the last month as far as these riots and stuff. I know it's a systemic problem that goes back for however long you want to measure it. And and that's certainly a problem that, that humans have is that we don't do well interacting with each other. Um, newsflash, it's been going on since Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. But, <laughs> yeah. But humans don't do a good job of getting along together. And, and that's part of the problem that Christ died to deal with is that the forgiveness of sins is not just, you know, you get to die and go to heaven someday. No, it really, actually, that's not even a big part of it. The, the big part is, is restoration with God and then loving one another. And as we approach this situation, I think part of the benefit of being the church is we say our answer doesn't change based on the situation. Yeah. Yeah, you come at us with the next situation and we're going to look at you and say, well, here's the thing. People are sinful. God has done something to save sinners. And we invite you to repent and to, and to receive from God, his mercy and forgiveness in Christ. And they say, well, that's, that's not very practical. And I say, well, actually it's eternally practical. It might not address the thing that you're wanting it to address right now, but that doesn't make it less practical. We assume that the thing we want it to address is the right thing. Right. But the reality is, okay, look, most of the time we're focused on the wrong things because we're sinful humans and and we need God to do something to continually refocus us and pull it back. Kevin, I think church has something to do with that, doesn't it? Yeah, and that's exactly, that's one thing. <laughs> that's exactly why the, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and the congregations we go to, um, sees itself as a liturgical church with, you know, a lectionary series because it actually helps the church to not become reactionary to whatever is going on, but to continue yeah. to teach these eternal truths of God. Um, and it does take faith to believe that these things are actually the right way to see the world is that these is, and I truly do believe in this situation as in the next situation comes down the, the road in the, in the current events is that if we were to learn to lo- love the way God loves, that probably would solve this situation. Hmm. Right. And yeah. it's not just, it's not just me and you learning that it's all of us learning to repent. It's all of us learning to live selflessly. It's all of us learning to love our neighbor. It's all of us learning to lear- learn God's will for how we live our lives. Um, and it's and that's the church's job. It's it's not to solve the world's problems. It's to point the world to Christ and to talk about sin as the root of our problems and Christ as the one who has died to forgive sins. That's the the church does not try to solve the world's latest dilemma. To I mean what you said it's about Christ dying for our sins. That's the crucial conversation that we're trying to have here it's also the simple answer so i don't think we promised a solution at the beginning of this episode in in the sense that hey guys if you go out and do this by the end of the week everything will be fixed but at the same time we've presented what christ has done 
And he has promised that at the end of time, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, everything will be fixed. Mm-hmm. And it's because he promised it, not because we did on a podcast, but because he did. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully we've helped you guys see that a little bit today. And like us, as we are continually attempting to adjust our own <laughs> mental processes and, and repent of our own wrong ways of thinking about this and thinking through. Hopefully this has helped you refocus and see that even in this, as Kevin said, whatever situation comes up, it do, it, it truly doesn't matter what it is. The church only has one answer because we only need one answer. So that's what we got for you today. Kevin, any uh, other thoughts or anything you want to add there? Nope. Sounds good. Do you guys have any questions? Go on our website, crucialproductions.org. Click the Ask a Question button at the top. Send us an email, questions at crucialproductions.org. If you appreciate what we do, we'd appreciate your support. After you've given to your church, go to crucialproductions.org and click the Give button, and you can actually donate to what we do. That's all we got for you guys. Thanks a lot. Have a good evening. See ya.